I was uh I was also thinking of a podcast. If you guys are interested in that as well. Are we are we actively recording a podcast <laughs> now and you're trying to pitch another podcast? Fair uh, enough. Let's not, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. It's a kids. spin-off show. It's the Cacistocracy side quest podcast. Yeah, so how do you pronounce that? That that might be a good way to introduce the podcast. <laughs> I don't actually know how to pronounce the podcast that I'm currently on, I guess. Cacistocracy. So Cacistocracy is the word for a government run by the least suitable or least competent citizens of a state. Basically, it was uh, believed to have originated as early as the 17th century, according to the internet. And it was sort of a, I don't know, it was a happy accident, I guess, or I shouldn't say happy accident, but I was, I had the idea for the podcast first, unlike a lot of my other projects where it seems like I come up with like a fun name first and then have to like retroactively come up with something worthy to like structure around that which is probably not the best way to go about things, but... No, 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 no. Always yeah, high concept yeah. first. Always come <laughs> up with, like, a sleek name and logo, and then just, like, figure out what you're actually going to do later. That's, that's a, usually how yeah, good absolutely. business works. That's, uh... A logo is something that we are still in need of. I'll have to think about that after we finish recording. But uh, how this about was... Just a, a, how about just a big K, but there's, like, three of them? Like, there's a shadow? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, your boy is a professional graphic designer, so... Okay, yeah, well, I, we maybe we'll have to uh, chat well, about throw that. Throw me some bit. ideas. Prof I'll, uh, professionals absolutely. in quotation marks. Part of the... Now, see, question I don't... While, we're, while we're starting here. Are we going to try to um, limit profanity? Um, Fuck no. I guess Dylan has already answered the question, so you can go ahead and, yeah, this Probably podcast... Not. You probably just don't want to say anything that's going to get you canceled. Yeah, or, don't. Like, well, yeah, I mean, no, no shit. shit Obviously, yes. Uh, we, we have to be careful about which, which now, of our... Which, good thing we're talking about something like history, which never gets, like, politically divisive or, like, misconstrued well, or right, anything. Not at all. No, no, no. And if it does, we'll just revise it. Uh... It's not like people have <laughs> opinions about history. No. That's... May, I, may I say, Paul, your voice... Mm chef's kiss mm. <laughs> well thank when you the, when the sunlight hits the valley just right but uh anyway i guess to carry on with what we are here to do so cacistocracy the whole idea for the podcast came from uh wouldn't it be funny to make a podcast talking about just sort of various government failures um potentially also like revolutions too because revolutionaries are just you know wannabe governments insert mm. insert mm. rick meme here mm. um and so i had the idea of like hey there's like infinite source material there there's just i feel like pretty much any study of any government organization in history is going to ultimately result in you uh, finding incompetence because it turns out people are just bad at their jobs like at every level and so then uh, after i decided that i just sort of randomly came across i shouldn't say randomly i was googling around and came across the word cacistocracy which surprisingly has not been claimed i checked that too that was like immediately after finding cacistocracy because i was like that's a great name <laughs> i was like Cacistocracy. Uh, yeah, has someone else used this? Uh, and there is a podcast called Cacistocracy that, as far as I can tell, has th mm. three episodes, and the last one was uploaded in 2011. So I think we're in the clear. There's like a statute yeah, of limitations so. on on podcast names. Yeah. Eventually, I... every word in the dictionary is going to be its own podcast. Yes, inevitably. It's like the Futurama bit where it's like the only two names available are Poplars and I can't remember the other uh, the other option yeah. they had. I always liked there was like an MTV or Mad TV sketch. It was like um, it was like uh, clownpenis.fart <laughs> law firm and the only the only URL available was clownpenis.fart. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. All right. So we are here today to talk about for our very first uh, incompetent leader of history. I'm so excited. <laughs> we have John King of England. So 
Are either of you familiar with the Magna Carta, which I think has already been mentioned? <laughs> that is my favorite fishbowl entry for the party game Fishbowl. Because you have to watch people right. try to do yeah. charades of the Magna Carta. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, even after having literally just recently spent about eight or nine hours studying this to record this episode, I don't know what I would do for charades for the Magna Carta. I don't know if... Uh, Usually it's someone just signing something. I guess. Like, yeah. But then that, like, that could be like your will or I don't know, like giving autographs. I don't know what I would guess if I'm just like watching someone like well, mime. With Fishbowl, with Fishbowl, there's a set number of answers, right? There's different rounds. I don't want to go through and explain the rules of Fishbowl, but I mean, people, yeah, people can look it up. It's very done. fun though. So the Magna Carta. So to give a very brief <laughs> overview, uh, if you guys or anyone listening is only familiar with it, you know, from Fishbowl or whatever, and doesn't actually know the historical context. Um, the Magna Carta is a treaty, basically, that was signed between the King of England, who was John at the time, and a lot of his barons and lords, uh, because there was essentially like a mini civil war happening. The more you study this period of history, the more you realize, like, Civil war is a weird word because there's just kind of always some sort of civil insurrection happening in all these countries, it seems like. This but was like, this was like the 12, this is like around 1200. This is like, uh, uh, 1214, I believe, is the original signing of the Magna Carta, or 1215, my bad. And so. is, is this considered the feudal period because people are feuding? Yes, exactly. There you go. That's definitely the reason. So... <laughs> Basically, it was an establishment of, like, actual limitations on the king's power. It was supposed to require that the king, you know, would get some consent from the lords before he would just, like, you know, hey, I'm changing the law and uh, everyone with red hair is to be executed or something. Like, he's supposed to have some more restrictions on what he can do other than just being the absolute monarch who's in charge of everything and... You know, he's in charge because he's in charge, and you should just listen to him because of that. The no. divine right of kings. Exactly. Is, uh, so, actually, the the very the little research I did do right before coming doing this is that I, I watched clips from Ironclad, which I have seen the whole movie, but have you seen that movie? Ironclad? I have not. It's about, yeah, it's about like, a, a battle between one of the... Well, anyway, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but it, it has... Um, it has Paul Giamatti plays King John, the very, the very same, <laughs> um, and he does a very good job of because Paul Giamatti is a good, good uh, actor, but um, yeah, the, he has a good bit where he's like he has a good monologue where he's like, "I'm king because I'm king because God made me king, so that means that I'm the king." <laughs> it's like very circular logic. <laughs> Yes, uh, this is the level of logic that apparently, like, 1200s England just accepted, but they, have, I guess, would eventually reject, I should say. Um, so this document was kind of revolutionary at the time, even though a lot of what it set out to do was sort of not enforced all that strictly. It's still sort of known in history as this sort of great moment in civilization, uh, relatively speaking, <laughs> um, where... It's like, yeah, all the people, and by people, it's more just like the other rich people in the country. Like, they didn't really care that much about the serfs and peasants or whatever. But at least, like, more than just one dude was saying, hey, this is how we ought to run things. And it was, you know, the lords standing up to the king and being like, we do not accept these things that you've been doing, and we're going to try and create some sort of formal contract to put limitations on your power. And this was kind of a revolutionary idea at the time. And what, what tech tree in civilization do I research to unlock this? Uh, it's probably under culture, I would assume. Okay, all right, okay. I'll, I'll check the manual later. But... Yeah, so then you might be wondering, though, if this is such a revolutionary idea of, like, hey, the king is bad sometimes, so we should, you know put this uh document on him to you know put limits on his power so you might be wondering like since this has never been done before like how bad well, is king john to be the first person that everyone is like you know what we need something on paper here 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you say it's. I guess it's never been walked back the same way, but it's like there was kind of like the democracies of like Greece, but yes, but I, I I I don't know. Like, did they did those evolve from monarchies or or, or empires or I I don't know. I, I'm actually not super familiar with like the origins of Greek democracy, which is something I probably should look into because I'm sure it'd make another fascinating topic. I mean, it for has very podcast, little to but... do with this this topic, so I'm really glad I derailed us and got us talking about something that none of us know anything about. <laughs> uh, well, that's a little bit older than the too. period of history that I find most interesting. But sorry, you go you go on, yeah. Billy, as you were saying. No, uh, yeah, another like what I find interesting too, right? Um, something like that had never been done as you said right like they've never made a document to hold back the power of a king a king was just seen as like you know the ruler he was god right? walking on earth is one of the exactly. descriptions used so what inclined him to sign this document or in like who decided it who made it well what's funny is like even though the idea of like putting some legal boundaries on the king's power is new like the idea of like revolution and revolt and feuding over the throne like that's not new so i think he was inclined to sign it because he realized that uh basically the army that had been raised against him by his own subjects was more than he could deal with at that particular moment and yeah it's kind of a do or die situation yeah this kind of like raises a point that I was going to maybe make later in the episode, but hell, I'll get started on it now. And this is part of like, informs part of what I believe about reality and things and histories that like really in any situation, it's always, you're always operating under consent of the governed, Ooh, right? Sorry, I'm sorry. It, it, it's a little messed up, but like, you know, even in, in like a dictatorship or, or in like a, a monarchy, it's like, it it works because everybody goes along with it and if you piss people off enough in any system you know it, it's the, it's scary how m many times it doesn't happen like in, in instances of like north korea or in you know in very like bleak states where it's just like damn how much are people gonna take but like yeah under any system it doesn't matter what your rules are you know people will find ways to impart violence democratically <laughs> <laughs> if you push them far enough yeah i guess the um, real question is like getting all of the people to rise up at the same time essentially or i shouldn't say all of them but like a critical mass because yeah yeah well like and it's interesting in this case and it's similar to maybe another revolution that's uh happened on another continent uh is that like it it worked because the nobles you know it's like the king didn't didn't keep the nobles in his favor if the king had just had just like kept the nobles happy and like imparted his tyranny more on like the peasantry he probably would have not had to sign this well this is it's... this is true uh he did yeah because he was sort of like equally screwing everyone to an extent um like the peasants weren't super happy either but yeah he was a, a recurring theme in john as we talk about him is that he is not very good at keeping happy the people that he needs to keep happy uh, to like support his rule he pisses off his allies and his noblemen and just every other person who's sort of in some position of power pretty much he just screws over at various points in time which is not a great way to like maintain a stable government so yeah so john is to keep going with his story uh john is the son of henry the second and also Eleanor of Aquitaine, whose name I recognized because she is a playable character in Civilization VI. Um, also a badass name. Yes, nice. that is a pretty cool name. Um, now, as some Civ Six players might already know, what makes Eleanor interesting in Civilization VI, apart from the fact that she just like steals other people's cities out from under them, which is annoying, uh, is that she is a leader who's one leader, but you can actually choose which nation you want her to lead. She, you can play Eleanor as either the British or the French. Um, and there's a good reason for that. So at this point in history, England is either directly or indirectly in control of like more than half of France. 
So this is known as the Angevin Empire. And to be clear, it's not like really like England extending itself into France. So, yeah, England and France, they had like a small war, right? That lasted a couple years. Yeah, just one. Just one war. Um, just one war. Yeah, they just had the one little war. It wasn't really a big deal or anything. Like, there's no animosity between the, the yeah, French yeah, and Yeah, it was British a long time. Ago. Yeah, I think French and British, like, I think they're good now. I think uh, yeah. there's no hard feelings. This is actually, it's interesting, this particular time we're talking about, you know, 1215, 1216 is the last time there would be any violent tensions between France and England, and there was never any further warfare there yeah, I was, ever I, again. I, I, I wasn't actually, like, familiar with, like, when the Hundred War, Hundred Years <laughs> War, like, spanned. Like, um, a lot later than this. <laughs> okay, so, so I wasn't sure if, like, this yeah. is... This is like at the beginning of that, or if this no, is even this part is, of that this period. This is like a whole separate time that England and France are going <laughs> at each other. Um, they just England and France just don't get along. But in fairness, uh, like nobody gets along at this period in history. But yeah, England and France particularly just have such a hilarious history. But I just like killing people. <laughs> I'm just like I'm picturing that, but like all of Europe. <laughs> basically Just women babies anybody it doesn't matter <laughs> here i go killing again so the closest territories were pretty much under like british control so like normandy the sort of like northern coastline northwest coastline of france that's all pretty well under control the southwest coastal area that was actually the duchy of aquitaine which is you know what eleanor of aquitaine is connected to and that's like under the british control basically because of eleanor um and the actual like kingdom of france at this point is kind of like around paris like it's like what is technically france at this point politically is a much smaller area than what we would view as like being france today they england's got this collection of territories and duchies and whatever uh in france they're all part of the angevin empire and again like some of them are kind of more loyal to england than others but none of them are really part of france either although a lot of them might have you know french tendencies you know they uh they have their like secret baguette stashes and stuff like, it's like the... that's like a that's like a an old timey way of calling someone gay. Like, <laughs> oh, they have French tendencies. <laughs> I did not intend it that way, but yes, that does come across that way. <laughs> um, yeah, that tracks. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Um... <laughs> so John is born on December twenty fourth. 24th 1166 so he, oh, he's you know, a christmas baby yeah he's a nice little christmas present he was a christmas present he, he's the one I mean, gift that you get to open right? on like, christmas eve you know you get to pick out I, your one <laughs> before oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> i could see i could see like where like the god complex might come from then it's that's like, true actually you're born yeah, into royalty touch. and your birthday is like on christmas like you've got to think man i'm god's got me bro yep. i don't know if nobody else got me god got me now what's funny is though he is actually the fourth son or at least the fourth surviving son of mm -hmm. uh henry and eleanor and so as a result of this he wasn't really ever supposed to be the king and he's given the title john lackland which is hilarious because he's not supposed to inherit a whole lot of territory uh, thus he's you know lacking land i thought i thought that name was from him losing territory to the french now that but is what ultimately happens and... but yeah. <laughs> foreshadowing happens in real life apparently so yeah john's lands will be lacking by maybe the, the end of maybe this. the reason why he was oh. such a shitty king is that like nobody ever groomed him to be king you know it's like your first and second born it's like okay they gotta go study philosophy they've got to like spend some time learning combat they've got to like train and like get ready but it's like my fourth son oh i just want to let just let him go fuck off in the park and like you know finger bang the peasant girls it doesn't really matter like you're Lord. i mean you're unfortunately not too far off on the finger banging the peasant girls but we'll get into that later well, what's the point of being a prince <laughs> no. if you don't get to finger bang the peasant girl <laughs> 
So I hate this word. I hate the word <laughs> finger. It's, fucking so, it's so good and it's so much fun. I hate it. <laughs> I thought you were supposed to be sex positive. But I thought. Sorry, that's just, just I am sex positive, but. Well, it doesn't sound I like think it there's to more me. delicate ways to. Well, that's the French, the French way of. Fi- um... uh, it's... <laughs> yeah, that's very French of you. <laughs> Le menage finger. <laughs> okay, so John's born in 1166. He doesn't actually become king until 1199, 33 years later. Um, but he was appointed the Lord of Ireland in 1177. You know, when he's 11 years old. Um. <laughs> How old was he when he became king? Uh, 33. Okay. So actually, like, not bad compared to a lot of rulers at the yeah, time. You would think absolutely. that, like, that would help him out more. That, like, he's, you know, at least, like, a little bit more mature or whatever by the time he becomes king. Um, as opposed to, you know, a lot of other guys. Like, he, at least he's not, like, a Emperor Gordian or whatever of Rome who became like the emperor at age 13. This is when Rome is in decline, mm. I should clarify. <laughs> um but like he's got like you'd think he's got some more maturity to like back him up. He's you know been lord of Ireland for a while. Um unfortunately, Absolutely. apparently this is not true. Absolutely. Did you guys ever watch Parks and Rec? Yes. Yeah, it's like when uh Adam Scott like became the mayor of that town at 17 <laughs> or whatever it, it, yes he and he immediately it, it's that's what happens basically except instead of uh, throwing all of the empire's resources into building uh an ice theme park or whatever he just like yeah. tries to repeatedly reconquer the lands that he lost <clears throat> i mean can you blame a guy though i just like yeah, that's a noble goal for sure mm, sure i guess he, he's right. just bad at it like imperialism, like you gotta try it's just it. Bad at it. Well, I mean, I, I think there's a difference like between imperialism and like conquering more French land versus just like, hey, this is like this is on our island. Like if you got an island, if well, you're this the is British island. This is mostly. Or is he trying to reconquer French? Yeah, he's land? mostly trying to reconquer uh, French lands. Well, yeah, yeah. Then yeah, then I guess you know. Was it Joan of Arc, or is this after or before Joan this of Arc? This is before that as well. Before Joan of Arc. So, basically, uh, all he has to do is, like, wait, not just until his dad dies, but also all of his brothers. Also, there's a funny little side note here that, like, some of his brothers... He, like, sort of becomes the favorite son temporarily because, like, his brothers are impatient to wait for their turn to be king, and so they try to, like, overthrow their dad... Oh, um, man. and but like John actually doesn't go along with this, so you'd think maybe that would like bump him straight to the front. Of course not. He's number four. He's right. just like, what are you talking about? What? I'd still just be your lackey. So <laughs> also, I mean, what's the expected like age expectancy back then? You know, <laughs> like fourteen. Yeah, I feel like you're... the fact that he made it to thirty three is incredible. If you're like forties well, or fifties. The like, reason if you... why the life expectancy was so low is because of infant mortality. If you made it to ten, you would probably make it to fifty. Yeah, I think uh, I've heard okay. that before. You, so, yeah, I mean, there's a good like... chance you're gonna die in your yeah, like mid forties to mid fifties is like a good yeah. life expectancy around this time if you make it past yeah, like being five or six. Yeah. So, I mean, and if you're a king too, you're gonna eat pretty well. You're gonna have like the latest in medical technology, like leeches. You know, all of the finest lead goblets yeah. to drink from. <laughs> Bloodletting. Um, but yeah, so his brother is trying to do this rebellion thing, which doesn't work out. Um, but then, amusingly, his like family just reconciles. Like King Henry's, like yo, you know what? Like no hard feelings. Um, and so his brother Richard actually ends up being the king in front of him. And this is Richard the Lionheart. For... I totally see as like a dad. It's like you're throwing. He's like, I'm just so proud you showed the initiative. <laughs> this is really the kind of drive we need to see out of our future king. This is the kind of, yeah, this is the kind of go getter, positive synergy we like to see here at the British Empire. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Richard, he's the king for 10 years before John eventually becomes king. And what's funny is, in, like, a recurring theme here, 
John tries to usurp Richard's throne while Richard's away fighting the Third Crusade because that's another thing that Englishmen love around yes, this time. Yes, Richard sounds familiar. I was going to ask which Richard this was. but this, So this is the Richard that went on the Crusade? Yes, this is Richard and, the Lionheart, yep. And I, as I understand it, the Crusades went well, yes? Like most of the oh, time. Oh, yeah, fabulously. That's like, I'm sure that could be another topic of a future episode. <laughs> um the crusades just always worked so great and they established just really stable and wonderful regimes in the area and definitely didn't like sack constantinople on the way so like it's kind of funny how unstable the governments are at this time like modern british government like can change rapidly with snap elections and things but like basically these guys were just doing the same thing with war like, ah, oh, the king went away for, like, a month and a half. Like, eh, time to raise up my peasants in my region and see if yeah, I can, it's like, funny. overthrow. It's like without, without email, it's not our, like, yeah. Our... Fast. Oh, can you guys hear me him. now? Oh, he's back. Okay. You guys, uh, sorry, Dylan cut out, right, as he was saying, without email. Oh, yeah, I was just saying, like, without email, it's like, there was no way to know if somebody was, like, jacking, like, boosting your stuff. Yeah, you had carrier pigeon. Yeah, pretty much. Like, you had, like, this sort of long and very poorly put together mail chain that would sort of try yeah, and to bring Yeah, to go news. to Jerusalem. Yeah. So... Don't underestimate a pigeon. John, uh, John, you know, he tries... I European. He tries to, you know, take over the empire, as he does, and he raises his army. He's actually, like, uh, doing a pretty good job of like winning and pushing back against richard's chancellor a guy named longchamp who is like left in charge you know while he's gone and he gets them all holed up in the tower of london which is a prison i like that like that's the place where it's like yeah this is where they're basically just like self-imposed prison at that point like yeah i know what's going on i'm just gonna hide in the prison um but at this point, Richard the difference sends... between a prison and a fort is, I guess, if you have the keys or not. That's, hey. That is true. Hey. That is true. So at this point, Richard sends Walter of Cofance. I'm probably going to butcher a lot of these old pronunciations. I apologize. An archbishop back to England to, like, sort things out. Because I guess he's heard that, like, things are not going great. Um... And I like that, like, King Richard hears that his country is, like, basically in active insurrection. And he's like, yeah, should I go home? Nah, I'm gonna, like, keep killing Muslims. That sounds like a more productive use of my time. <laughs> I'll just send, like, my boy here back to try and straighten stuff out. He's like the American sniper of, <laughs> of fucking crusades. He's just having too much fun like killing people in the middle east to like deal with this stuff <laughs> so the archbishop he rallies basically, that's basically the exact plot of the hurt lock <laughs> yeah it's good to just... know that like the, even that far back all people of importance are just fucking sociopaths nothing ever changes that's the important thing you remember about yeah. human history it's always just the same absolutely. thing absolutely so oh, the archbishop rallies a bunch of troops loyal to richard and basically despite john's attempt to actually secure an alliance with uh, france this is kind of funny like they hate the french but like this is also a recurring theme like whoever the rebel is like also tries to like constantly ally with the french like oh hey yeah, you know we're enemy of my anime is my... yeah you can always count on the french to like hey i, I want to take over here and you you don't like this person too i'm mm -hmm. sure this will last right up into the point we kill the current king of england yeah because then i'll be the king of england yeah. and then by necessity i'll hate the french uh, it's what could go wrong so uh john like the things revolving don't... door of politics am i right folks right so john realizes that he's outmatched here and he retreats back to normandy actually um again part of the angevin empire currently and richard comes home and finds him there Huh. Now, if my brother attempted to, like, violently overthrow me while I was gone, like, I'd probably be a little bit distrusting of him. But instead, Richard's like, my brother, like, his only wrong here was that he had evil counsel. He's just a child. He, again, he's 27 by this point. Mm. But he's just a yeah. child. Uh, and, like, 
really not a bad guy and so his only punishment is he gets some of his like titles and like land holdings taken away but he still continues to be lord of ireland so like you get like that whole other island that's sort of next to england like you can still be in charge of that but like some of these other little duchies like i gotta take this back because what a good bro man yeah that is a big bro moment bro moments in history so yes at this point john i guess is like you know what i'm just gonna be patient and wait for this dude (laughs) two brothers conquering the french (laughs) kings of england (laughs) you don't want to hear about it here but (laughs) it's great um so john i think he just realizes like he's better off maybe just like wait for richard to die or something or maybe he's just biding his time like and hoping to come up with a different plot um and so i mean he's next in line for the throne he is next at this point point, yes okay and so he uh basically ends up like being loyal to john for the next five years until john's death and he's actually like fighting like he he actually wins a lot of favor back from richard um because he's uh fighting for him like he's leading military campaigns and stuff in france and he's actually like a decent general by most accounts like he's not like Napoleon. Well, he had all that practice trying to overthrow his brother. That's true. That's a great, the best. It's like a war game. Uh, it's training. He's actually like decent. He's not Napoleon. He's not any like brilliant leader, but he comes up with some like interesting ideas. Like amusingly, at, at one point, he actually tries like one of the first like naval and land combined arms assaults, mm. which kind of like fails basically because like it was really hard to try and organize like a multi pronged like multi-domain operation like that at this time you know before you have like again no telef- text messages yeah, yeah exactly he didn't have the guy with the big radio on his back but like he's actually like a decent general when he's fighting in france uh for his brother um but then we get around to eleven ninety nine in april and richard dies and after another like brief Happened civil death. war because that pretty much happens every time the king dies because it's like oh I should be king because I was the king's brother. And then there's like some other, you know, group of nobility, like, not, ah, uh, like your yeah, other like you brothers. Gotta get, you you like, gotta go for it when it's up for grabs. That's probably the most unrealistic. Well, I guess, I guess there is kind of a conflict in Macbeth. I was going to say that's the most unrealistic part of Macbeth is that nobody disputes the crown with Macbeth, but then there's like the whole fight at the end. So I'm just, I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> it's all good. So, uh, John is crowned king um, about a month after Richard's death because even though, like, the war is still technically going, like, by that point, like, John was just sort of the clear favorite, like, and enough of the nobility was supporting him that, like, they were like, yeah, we're just going to crown this guy king. And, you know, their relatively small fringe group was eventually just sort of kept in line a few months after that. Hmm. Now, it should be pointed out that some of the opposition who believed that Arthur of Brittany, who was John's brother, Geoffrey, who's the eldest brother of the... uh, John's brother, Geoffrey's son, should be king. It's not Geoffrey, it's Geoffrey? Geoffrey, Geoffrey, sorry, again. Uh, Geoffrey? Mispronouncing things is one of my special skills. No, no, I remember, it's Rafiki. Rafiki, yes. I thought that was actually just pronounced Geoffrey. Oh, I've been mispronouncing John this whole time. It's actually Julian. Just picture him as a lemur. It's uh, actually with... John. <laughs> um, honestly, like, who knows how people talked at this point. That's the other funny thing. Yeah, that's like, a good point. Like, we have the written word, but, like, accents change What if they actually all had, like, Indian accents? <laughs> and that's what they took to... Yes, this is King John. And they they took that to India. Like, people in India didn't talk like that until the British showed up. Oh, that would be great. That would actually be hilarious. And now I'm just picturing, like, hello, this is King John. Can I help you with reconquering the French? Okay, so basically a lot of, yeah, ju- the English holdings in France were kind of more supporting of Arthur of Brittany. Um, but they kind of fall in line. Um, this is partially because Arthur was being supported by Philip II, who's the current ruler of France. Again, probably just because France was going to support like whoever they thought would like help destabilize England more, or whoever they thought they could like have more power over, probably. So again, there's like some. So, 
there's some conflict there's some infighting but like everyone mostly decides to fall in line and recognize him like after the coronation after a few months um but it's at this point that john is decides there, is there a specific like when when there's like these conflicts early on this is obviously with like some fraction of nobility is this like localized is this like within any a, lo- kind of a lot of it or... is localized to at this point localized to like the north of france area okay. but but it also later on he's going to have rebels from like the northern part of england and scotland and everything because he just pisses off more so it starts out and most people are just like yeah john's cool he's like the he's like the bro he's one of the good bros yeah god you wants know. him to be king like, god it's... wants him to be king he's got the he's got, Christmas. the he's got the yeah. special blood that gives him jedi powers or whatever like yeah, um, blood. <clears throat> the special blood it. the special blood yes. that comes from repeated generations of incest and uh, yes! Europe, european yes. nobility <laughs> so and genocide yes it's it's the blood of like all of the people his family is killed like flowing together do you think they had a do you think they had adrenochrome back then do you think like back then the royalty was still feasting on children do you think that's gone back well maybe feasting in a different way maybe because it's at this point that john decides to marry a 12 year old girl Uh, again he's like 33 at this point and also, oh. I should uh, be fair here. So the sources. Oh, that's for... my age. Oh, oh. Ugh. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so uh. the sources for the girl's birth are actually a little bit in disagreement. So twelve might not be correct. She might be as old as fourteen. Um, so well, that, that makes, makes it better. better. Yeah, exactly. Um, she might also be as young as nine. That's also uh. possible. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, so this is great. But we're just going to call it 12 because, like, I don't know. At least it sounds better than 9. I don't know, man. Like, Well, it's 12 like the ge- – well, yeah, we'll split the difference because if it might be 14, it might – so, yeah. All right, so, you know, you got your 12-year-old child bride, as you do. Right, and this uh, particular lady is Isabella of Angol- Angolame. Um, now, John was already married to another woman named Isabella – um if only eleanor of aquitaine was also named isabella then john could be like the incompetent pedophile version of ron swanson like yes both my wives were named tammy and so was my mother but what (laughs) what what difference does that make (laughs) um but yeah so isabella the child is already engaged to hugh the ninth of losing Uh, again with these names Lusignana or something like that he's do your best. the point is he's a french lord from normandy word and, and i guess this is the, this is a part of france that was under british <coughs> occupation yes this was under british occupation um but like again these guys are allegedly loyal to john but still have their french tendencies as we've described oh. Like apparently twelve year old brides. <laughs> yes, like apparently twelve year old brides. The and... French haven't changed much in eight hundred years. <laughs> and he, you know, he really wants to marry her, and he's a little upset that John's gonna just swoop in and be like, "Nah, this one, this one's for me." Mister, steal your girl. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, pr- dick move on John's part. Um, so john might be king but hugh thinks like he's still entitled to some kind of compensation under the traditions of the time like you know john should like yeah you can take my girl but like at least give me like some for my fiance (laughs) give me some like gift cards to like applebee's or something like to make up for it i don't know like but john doesn't care uh like you know he's not gonna give him any money he's not gonna like offer him something in return or i don't know try and marry mm, some other cold, nobility to him cold. um basically he just tells him to stick the like suck it uh and he gets like multiple calls from the norman nobles who are again like a little annoyed at this to like hey like come have court with us let's talk about this like this isn't cool and every time he's like nah i'm the king like i'm above all that like i don't need to talk to you guys like i'm just gonna marry this child um so i mean to be fair he is king he is king but they're still annoyed that he's not like respecting (laughs) their you know traditions or whatever yeah so 
Now, okay, and so John already also had a wife. Yes, right? which he he separates so from in he order had, to marry. He has a wife, and then he sees this other dude's fiance, and he's just like, hmm. Mm. Mm, yeah, the twelve-year-old one—that's what I want. Damn yep. son. Mm. Yes. That, that couldn't have put him in good standing with the church too, because they don't really dig like divorce and stuff. He was not. Right? He was not seen as like a pious man. Um, mm. No, I was just saying. I also see here that uh, he also had more than ten known illegitimate children. Yes, Woo! he also had uh, a tremendous amount of mistresses. Yeah, um, who so he, he often like took he mistresses. Was a guy. In addition to marrying, like, some other guy's fiancé, he often took mistresses from, like, the wives of some of his other nobles. So, again, he was just, like, really good at, like, pissing off all the people that, like, he needed to help enforce his rule. So, he's just horny. He's, he's just he's a fucking, fucking horny... Damn, dude, he's like the JFK like... of England. Yeah, <laughs> he's the Chad King, dude. Chad like, King. The Chad John up. versus the, the Chad Virgin John. Richard. <laughs> One goes and fights for God, and the other is just like, asleep with all the women. <laughs> My um, man. So, this results in a series of uprisings. The first one is basically just Hugh, uh, the guy who was, you know, engaged to the 12 year old. Um, and he's easily able to crush this. However, now King Philip of France gets involved. And, you know, supporting the Norman yeah. lords. And things start to go poorly. So in 1202, another war breaks out in Normandy. <sighs> this is, again, where we revisit the idea that you can be good there's at specific things. There's been a few, there's been a few, there's been a few wars in Norm Normandy. Yeah, yeah like, honestly, at this point in the podcast, I'm not even sure how many, like, wars, quote-unquote, we've already talked about. Like, because, again, like war was just kind of constantly happening it kind of seems like yeah. at this point so i'm not even sure if you want to call them separate wars or more just like i pauses. like that it's like a helen of troy situation too where it it's it's totally like they're just starting wars over like sleeping with each other's wives <laughs> yes so again john is not a horrible military commander but he's he is a really bad statesman like he's like he's like the opposite of Hitler. Like he Hitler was really good at like, you know, getting political power, but like was by all accounts like a really bad military decision maker, but he was good at, you know, manipulating like the various people he had to do to like, you know, hold on to power and get power in Germany. And like this is like the opposite of that. Like just he's like apparently pretty decent at actually like fighting wars but like has no no experience it seems like with like manipulating or you know negotiating or pleasing the people he needs to please to actually like stay in power um so he has a number of successful battles in which he captures like prisoners nobility like norman nobility and then he treats them like crap to the point where like a lot of them are actually like dying in his captivity which just like pisses off all of the other Norman nobility because they're like, hey, like you shouldn't be treating noblemen like that. Um, Thanks, and if sir. that's Thanks. not bad enough, he's also continually slighting his ally, ally William de Roches, uh, to the point where William actually switches sides and joins the French. So how does he slight him exactly? Is he just like he just fuck his wall? He just. <laughs> He just, like, doesn't, like, like he doesn't want to, like, acknowledge him. He doesn't, like, he basically it seems like he's, like, a glory hound. And, like, he doesn't care about other guys' opinions. He doesn't, like, want to work with them. He just kind of expects everyone else to, like, work for him, I guess. And just do whatever he says. Um, and, like, everyone should just do what I say. And, like, I'm not going to help you if you need help. You sh you're here to help me. Like, I don't care what's going on with your sector of the campaign like that's that's your problem but then like when i want to do something you should definitely come down here to help me well, he's out the king yeah he's, obviously you know, the king doesn't help you you help the king right you? ask not what you can what i can do for you ask what you can do for your king so so john you know he doesn't respect the dignity of the angevin lords who are loyal to him he doesn't respect the dignity of the nobles that he's capturing um, he's just not very good at any of this whole, like, actually dealing with people thing. And even though he's, like, doing decently well militarily, he's, like, steadily losing the ability to prosecute the war. Because, like, a lot of his allies are either turning on him 
or like not giving him permission to move through their lands because he's just like offending eco. them. It's like having bad eco in in, in age. Yeah, in or rise. or like you need you know you're at war with someone and this like you need to open doesn't borders. Doesn't matter how good your micro is if your micro could be excellent, but if you don't have the resources to, to sustain your campaign, you know. It's, yeah, it's over. Yeah. So you, you just get taken out by the attrition damage, you know. Yes. So John um, tries to get like fellow like you know child lover the Pope to intervene, mm. um, but the Pope whose name is Innocent the Third at this time, which is fantastic. It's like a rapper's name. <laughs> no, I'm Innocent the Third. Uh, like a real sensual like okay. <laughs> so the Pope. Uh, he, he fails and like he fails to like you know cr create a peace that's favorable to John. Uh, and in twelve oh four, this is you know two years later, Chateau Galliard, John's last remaining stronghold in the Norman region, it falls to the rebels and also Eleanor of Aquitaine, John's mother who's still alive at this point, passes away. Uh, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, like, again, she was, like, a par big part of, like, the o the uh, Angevin Empire's, like, claims to a lot of fr France. Like, uh, a lot of French people, like, respected her or whatever. And so her dying is, like, a major problem because now he's lost that, you know, unifying thread of, like, oh, hey, but my mom, though, like, she's pretty cool in France. Um, that's That goes away. Bro, right, you literally, like... The stereotypical ride on your mom's coattails. Like, he's, <laughs> he's just like a horny mama, mama's boy the whole time. <laughs> so, yes, with these um, blows... Oh, man, there was something you said earlier. I wanted to back up because the Pope... Didn't the Pope, like, declare... Like, when he when John went to the Pope, didn't the Pope, like, be like, yes, he's the king of... He, like, basically he just declared that, like, John was the king. But, like, nobody really gave a shit, basically. Like... He, he did something, but I, I just remember, because that's the one thing I looked up, is that technically, like, John was king of England, but he was supposed to be, like, under the Pope, is that, like, technically the Pope was going to own England. There's there's sort and of a it, weird like, agreement later. Yeah, yeah. So, but I could, could you imagine, like, if that had gone through and then, like, England just became, like, the new Catholic, like, mega, I don't know. <laughs> like, the, the Vatican just moves mm. to London. Um... That would be like you. That would actually be horrible. You'd have like the city of London and the Vatican like somehow in the same place. Like I don't know mm. what would result of that. You'd um, get extra. You'd get that like extra pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> so, with these blows to his power, John loses all of the lands in the Angevin French Empire except for the Duchy of Aquitaine. Um, so mm. basically, like the whole northern. That's a really nice duchy, though. If yeah. You've been there. Yes. One of, the, one of the best. What is that? Lots of people tell me. Um, the Duchy of Aquitaine. It's down in like the southern and like southwest coast of France. Interesting, because so, like I would imagine it would have been because there's this one spot. It's funny that all of the battles happen at Normandy because there's a spot along the English Channel that's like really close, obviously to France, but mm -hmm. like that appears to. It's like I guess the French knew it was like. We'll build all our defenses here because obviously they'll cross where it's closest. And then the <laughs> English were like, "No, we'll go to the f the furthest south of France." Just we'll the the time honored tradition of invading it's Normandy. It's still only a thirty. It's still only like thirty minutes more of sailing, I guess. They're <laughs> so close to each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, actually part of the problem. Is like part of why John wants to retake uh, the like normandy so bad is because he's like oh they're like gonna cut us off you know from mm. the southern part like we have to sail around france now to get to the part we actually own um probably also too just because like his pride is wounded so especially when they name you lackland that's got yeah, a thing that's that's got a like thanks mom and dad like <laughs> Could you imagine, like, the, the level of complexes this guy's operating on, though? It's like, you rise your mom's co coattails, you're, you're married to a little kid, <laughs> you're named Lackland, you were the fourth in line, but somehow you, like, you you eked it out. You eked out the, the throne only to have it go, like, terribly your entire life. <laughs> but at least he slayed, dude. I guess at least he got a lot of pussy. 
<laughs> I, I guess mean, so. Um, so John tries to follow the tradition of kings that have come before him because now he's like actually having to rule England. Like he can't be away doing war anymore, you know, for at least a little while. Um, so he's like back in England and he does like a moving court system which like think less of like having like a capital where like all of the stuff happens and more like John and his court like sort of rove around from place Wherever to place. Wherever he is, it's funny because it's like it seems like he's been at war a lot. When he wasn't king, when he was like sitting around waiting, did he go on campaigns? Yeah, he, just, he like, was he it? was campaigning Word. before. So yep. nice. that makes sense that he just, he's just used to like you know being on the road with his boys. He just likes hiking. Yeah, I mean, I, his, his, his cardio is amazing. You can see in the portrait. Oh, no, he's him. got people that carry him. <laughs> um, Their cardio, his peasant's <laughs> cardio, is top notch. John had one of the most successful anti obesity rules in England of this time. Um, so, John, he's running around from place to place, like managing the issues in that area. And this has been done before um, by kings that have come before him but like in some ways this is good and it keeps everyone like kind of in touch with the king however it also means the king is like directly trying to micromanage everything so yeah, again it's not a good strategy if you're an asshole exactly like you. they needed to hide him like they hide joe biden <laughs> pretty much they just like send out the press secretary to go like take questions and like the king is very busy right now trust me um I'm mad. So, imagine if your county board, yeah, is just trying to like make a decision about like some boring zoning ordinance, and all of a sudden they like wheel Biden in on his dolly, like and just like dump him in the middle of the table, and they're like, nah, "I'm gonna make the decision about how we zone things here in whatever whatever county we're in." Like that's basically what's happening. The king is just like bursting in and being like, "Ah, let me solve all your problems." Everything. Yes. Um, and the the problem is like as societies become bigger and more complicated, like this becomes harder to do well, right? Like maybe back in the day, this could have been done well. Like some kings probably were very successful doing this sort of thing. Um, it gets harder, like the more complicated and big your country gets. You so delegate. yeah, you really should. Um, this is also part of why just monarchies in general just don't work. Um, but yeah. It's also a double-sided sword in the ad. If the king is more directly involved in ruling when things are going good, the king is probably going to be viewed well. But if things are bad, the king is going to be more directly seen as like, yeah, it's that guy's fault, as opposed to being like, ah, Lord, you know, Jacrana whatever, like up in the castle, Lord Farquaad, he's, he's messing <laughs> things up. Like, but the king, you know, down in London, he's probably a good guy chosen by God and whatever. It's just my dumb lord that I have to contend it's, it's with. It's kind of like how when you get in trouble in school, they send you to the they send you to the assistant principal or the vice principal. They don't send you to the principal. Like the principal was always the cool one that like shot the basketball at the, at the <laughs> prep rally. But then, like when you get detention, it's always from the vice principal. Yeah, it's like another Parks and Rec joke where we've yeah, got yeah, we've yeah. got um you've got rob lowe's character who's always super upbeat and then you've got ben who's like there to shoot everyone down like that is a great idea i love it so much ben can we afford it no and you're all fired like <laughs> yeah like basically a similar idea um but instead john just he loves being involved in this apparently this <laughs> and like yeah. not also like the nobles don't necessarily like the king just like riding into town and like sticking their nose in their business um, and then there's, there's also criticism. So John was expanding the legal system. Like in some ways this was viewed as like, ah, oh, good. Because he was like, he was sort of like being more quote unquote fair. And that like, he was just sort of equally prosecuting everything apparently. Like as opposed to like, I guess previously be more traditional. Like, oh, we're just going to let some stuff slide and sort of like selectively enforce justice. Mm -hmm. He was more like oh, we're just going to, like, we have, like, an equal bar for everyone. But this was also viewed as maybe just a way to, like, generate more fines. Yeah, wasn't he, like, kind of in the for-profit prison? Yes. His early adoption of for-profit policing. Which is funny because there's, like, a note in some of the historical, like, accounts of this that, like, 
this has like been like continued forward like as an example of like how to do western like law like to this day and it's like oh great yes this is what we needed um (laughs) speaking of money john could not get enough of it and you see john you know he really wanted to retake normandy as we were talking about um but the problem is you need money to fight wars right now have you ever felt like the government kept taking your money but not actually giving you anything worthwhile in return for it except for like a really nice war in iraq (laughs) basically the same thing um so john keeps raising money to fight a campaign in Normandy, but these end up being, like, unsuccessful or are constantly being delayed. Um, So, meanwhile, he's, like, figuring out new and innovative innovative ways to steal money from his subordinates, uh, making him very popular. So, first of all, he's got taxation. John created some of what could now be viewed as, like, early sales and income taxes, or, like, taxes on, like, moving and selling goods um yeah that's yeah. interesting actually he expands the import and export duties and if a baron wouldn't um or couldn't afford to pay them john would just like take the barony from him so cool oh um and he was like you know he sold charters for towns and markets because like you know that's a normal thing to do at the time he taxes the jews specifically um because you know that's just again a thing you do i guess this actually kind of like starts like a period in England of like the kings like like yeah the Jews like we need all your money um, but that's a different story um, and also he abuses a system called scuttage um, and scuttage was basically the idea of like when the king wants to go to war he could call up his barons and lords and be like yo fight for me or give me money it was like legalized draft dodging like you can either come and fight the war or give me money huh. um and kings actually enjoyed using this because like going to war is expensive and you probably don't need like all of your lords to do it and you probably don't want all of your lords to necessarily go with you to war so like you know like some will stay home and like govern and they'll like give the money to support the war for the rest of them to go off and fight like it's a great you, idea you do like mulan where you send your daughter well it's supposed to spend your son but you actually send your daughter and <laughs> she learns how to be a man but in like a but like instead of sending your daughter or your son you just send like piles of cash i guess yeah. but you yeah. still send like a little spirit dragon voiced by eddie murphy well that's the best part obviously. teach lesson life lessons to the pile well, you of can cash. you can make the cash <laughs> look like a person and you send it right that's you just you throw it over the battlefield and all the enemy soldiers will rush to like grab it and then while they're while they're bent over picking up the money you just like decapitate them that's the Uh that's using the old noodle oh no so uh john has this cool idea of like what if we do scuttage but without actually the going to war part so he he just like (laughs) demands just like (laughs) jesus so it's just taking people's money basically (laughs) yes so john damn why didn't i think of that the fucking chad king i love him just threaten to go to war (laughs) so john he demands scuttage from his nobles no less than 11 times during his 16 year rule uh, which is three times more than any of his predecessors have done yikes Um, and he's basically using it as like an annual income tax at this point like oh yep like you know april's here time to pay your scuttage gotta figure out like how much you owe like oh do i get a refund this year no there are no refunds ever (laughs) that's not how this works um unsurprisingly this created a lot of discontent with the nobility yeah if if your if your wife is a minor, do you still file jointly, or <laughs> are they a dependent? <laughs> These are valuable questions at the time in England. Jesus. Yeah. So then again, John is also just viewed as generally being like a horrible person. Like I said, he's like taken a lot of his noblemen's wives as consorts, and he's like just offends people at every turn like the guy has like apparently just no social skills whatsoever uh there there are rumors going around i can't imagine why 
that John was irreligious. Um, and this is obviously like a big deal at the time. Like, I guess he didn't take communion. Like, there were rumors that he made like like blasphemous remarks. Hey, how how you how do you like? You're into being king, right? Which means like you're into the ritual of things, and it's like he's got to know like he's fucking with all these girls. He just must have like the biggest fucking ego <laughs> in the world to like then like not take communion. Like it's literally like wine and yeah, some just, bread. just drink some wine and eat the bread. Man. And let like, the freaking priest yeah, like yeah. touch your shoulder, like. <laughs> Yeah, and then it, just turn around and be like, "Well, God wants me to be king, but I'm not gonna drink his blood. That's grody." Yeah, John like doesn't seem to care that much about religion, like based on what we do know about him. But then, of course, he tries to use the church at every opportunity to, like, you know, cement his own power. You know, as you do. Um, there was even some rumors going around that John was an atheist. <gasps> Honestly, he probably like. He probably was just really cynical. <laughs> like, listening to all of his, like, behavior, he's like, yeah, he probably didn't believe in any of it. It was probably just like he would say, it's kind of like taking the, the scuttling or the scootling. Sco scuttage, yeah. Scuttage. The scuttage. That's a fun word. But, like, taking the scudge, it's just like, uh, what's the thing where they give me the money? Yeah, the scudge. <laughs> not at war? Uh, who gives a shit? Give me the fucking money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this guy, yeah, he's he's quite the character. Um, he, he reminds me of a cokehead. Did they have amphetamines back then? This is, uh, like, classic, like, cokehead I, behavior. I don't know. Maybe he was the first cokehead. That's possible. Um, maybe, like, while he was, yeah, out... Like, you Discovered know, being, cocaine. being bored um, as his brother's off doing, like, crusades and stuff. Mm. And he's, yeah, he finds coke. Um, so this kind of escalates into he gets into a little bit of a disagreement with the church. And eventually the Pope places, like, a religious embargo on England which is kind of hilarious where the clergy are only allowed to baptize the young and they can tend to the dying, but they cannot hold any like regular church services or anything, which obviously causes like mass public like protest essentially. Cause you know, the religion is very, very important at this point in history. So John responds to this by seizing church property and arresting clergy if they would not conduct services which basically just makes him like more unpopular because everyone's looking at him as like oh my gosh he's like attacking the church like this is you you, you with the robe on say the funny latin words or you're going to the the brig <laughs> yes Sorry. i was just like yeah i was picturing the the town guard like holding up a priest like you better give this service or <laughs> it's gonna be a walloping now now father that was only 10 minutes it's normally two hours we know you're just faking it the whole mass this time <laughs> so so john he's eventually like has to concede to the pope um and this is part of like where the whole discussion of making like england like a papal That's empire right. and whatever yeah. happens um, and he promises to pay the church a bunch of money to like smooth things over, most of which he just never paid. Uh, and I guess the Pope was just like, fine, like, I'll, you know, I'll take the money you give me, but then I'm just going to let the rest of it go because I don't want to like force the issue and cause a problem, I guess. Uh. So, yeah, all of this unpopularity finally brings us to the first baron's war which would ultimately end john's rule so as mentioned john taxed his nation relentlessly and as a result many of the nobles owed john debts that they just couldn't repay mm. tensions were inflamed when in 1214 john tries to take normandy one last time when he's raising his army uh he was on a more time yeah, one last time gotta teach him how to take normandy anyway alexander hamilton can honestly be like another subject of a cactocracy episode but 
Um, I, there's, yeah, there's something, there's a good. part of me, like, that just refuses to watch that musical or learn anything about Hamilton. Um, I like the musical, musical but that's, good. yeah, that's because I'm just a sucker for musicals. Like, I just, I don't know why. I don't like regular plays, but for some reason, just, musicals I, just get the, me. Yeah, the way yeah. that that was, the way that that was marketed and distributed, I just know there's some kind of MK Ultra thing going on. Like, <laughs> I'm worried the trigger. One of the trigger words is in Hamilton. <laughs> Not all of them, but Dang. yeah, it's it's priming you. It's like setting. It's like initiating each of the detonators one yeah, musical yeah. You don't, at a time. You don't want to. You don't want to um, sub, subject yourself oh, well, to too much of the programming. Um, <laughs> more like just sheeple agents. Am I right? Oh. Am I right, folks? The globalists. So in, I'm coming. in 1214, John's like, the globalists All right, with their scottage. it's going to work this time. Let's go. And he raises an army to go take Normandy. Um, but he's unable to get many of the nobles to actually even like go with him. Um, and then even the nobles that did go with him, like there was a lot of like insubordination in the army. So he's like attacking mm. strategic fortified positions uh, at Roche a Moyne or Roche a Moyne, something like that. Roche a Moyne. Yeah, Roche a Moyne, Roche a Man. I don't know. Ro Rochambeau. It, it the the in French a lot of the ends of words are silent, so it's probably like Roche a O, Roche a U. I don't know your French. That's not right. Your French tend tendencies are showing. I don't know. Um, so, whoa, buddy, <laughs> you can't just accuse a man of that. <laughs> So his plan of, I have rights. his plan is to like force the French to face him at this position and he knows that he currently outnumbers their forces. So if he can like force this decisive battle, then you know he can win and hopefully then like break out into the countryside and basically just like conquer the whole area. Um the problem is many of his lords, you know, and all the like feudal troops under them, refuse to actually attack with him. Which sort of ruins his whole outnumbering them plan. Um, after this... It's Kit... like when you tell your team to go B-site and then <laughs> they just hang out and spawn. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happens. Guys, uh, I got the entry frag. Come B. <laughs> what are you doing? So, <laughs> France... After this, uh, King Philip of France de defeats a group of John's few allies... Uh, leaving him pretty much totally unsupported, and John is forced into a humiliating peace treaty, when, which he, like, once again recognizes, like, okay, yeah, Normandy's not mine anymore, fine. Um, so John returns to England, once again having taken everyone's money and also having nothing to show for it. Um, and as he returns, there's already a plot underway to oppose his rule. So John sends a bunch of his like loyalists to go talk to. All the... we do is win, 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 no matter what. Yes. So he <laughs> sends that song. So he sends a bunch of his boys to go talk to the rebel barons that are mostly conspiring in like the north and eastern parts of the country. Um, and they're they're actually telling them like, oh yeah, John's actually totally down with like agreeing to reforms on the king's power. But in reality, it's believed that, like, he's just stalling for time. Um, and he's trying to get a letter of support from the Pope to, like, yeah, proclaim that, like, John is king because he is king and God said so. And I'm the Pope and I talk to God and, like, it's all good. So, so after, like, he basically, like, had, like, a low-key, like, soft war with the with Catholicism, he's going to go to the Pope and be like, yo, could you, like, vouch for me? Yeah, pretty much. Now, the Pope actually sends him the letter, which is hilarious, so maybe he should have been, like, Pope Naive the Third. Dude, this whole period, <laughs> this whole period from the beginning of the story to the end is just people, like, fucking up royally <laughs> and then coming to each uh, other hat in hand like, I'm sorry, could you, could you forgive me for a bunch of money I'm not going to pay back? And they're like, sure, buddy. Like, this shit is baffling. Like... <laughs> it is incredible. 
It's uh, like it was like it was too much trouble to like punish people in authority. I guess we kind of have the same thing now, where it's just it's too much of a it's too much trouble to hold anybody accountable. So you're just like, don't do that again. <laughs> oh, I did it. Well, don't do I it mean, another time, though. I mean it yeah. this time. I'm gonna don't make me come up there. So one power. The letter arrives from the Pope. But by this point, time. by this point, the barons have already like organized their resistance, so it's too late. So in April, a bunch of rebels march down from the north, and they end up taking London. Um, and John agrees to meet with the rebel leaders at Running Mead, um, where he basically acknowledges that he's currently just totally outmatched. Um, and he decides to sign the peace agreement that they're offering him, known as the Magna Carta. Oh, I know that one. Yeah, we talk, which we began the episode talking about. Um, yeah, fishbowl. As I, yes, exactly, the fishbowl topic. Um, it placed protections on church property. It demanded revisions be made to the justice system. It required the king to seek approval for new taxes. Um, and it also required that a council of 25 barons be set it in place to advise the king and to make sure that he followed the terms of the agreement. It was like a pretty good idea. Like it was like revolutionary at the time, but literally yeah. neither side followed it. Um, so the parents didn't trust John to uphold his side. And so they failed to return London to him, which was, you know, one of the conditions of the deal was like, Hey, give back like the main city. Um, the big one. Yeah. And then meanwhile, John reached out to the Pope again I love how, like, again, he just, like, oh, I have a problem. Pope. Oh! <laughs> and the Pope... Pope, they won't give me back my London! And basically, the, the Pope declares that the agreement is nullified. Which I love that the Pope just has the authority to do this. He's like, yeah, that treaty that I was not nope. party to, that's... Nope, that's... It's, it's, it's not in the Bible, so get rid of it. Mm-hmm. So now, at this point, actually, like, not much actual combat had happened... Like, it was more just, like, John understood that, like, he was outmatched or he believed he was. And so he was like, all right, like, I'm just going to, you know, agree to this, like, because I don't want to die. Um, but at this point, like, the military option, I guess, starts to look more appealing. And so John oh, had yeah, enough money sacked away from, like, all the times he's, like, you know, pillaged his own empire, basically. Um, that he's able to hire a bunch of mercenaries to bolster his own loyalist troops. And he begins to isolate and overwhelm the rebels' positions. So Scotland has, meanwhile, aligned themselves with the rebels because, you know, obviously. Um, cause Scot yeah, this is with uh, Mel Gibson, right? <laughs> sure, sure. And so this is where this is where that movie, I think this is where that movie takes place, or when this movie takes place. The iron, the ironclad, which I think, like, I think you'd like it if you haven't seen it. It's actually pretty good because it's it's mostly about like a knight, and I think it's supposed to be somewhat historically accurate to how they fought and like how you know whatever. Obviously, it's still Hollywooded up. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of got that classic like let's assemble a team, <laughs> and then we need like, a guy who can shoot a longbow. Um, we need a guy yeah, who knows horses good. Like, basically, I can build it's like, you a custom horse, man. We can get away from the citadel or whatever. It, and, it's basically like twelve. It's like twelve people. It's a it's a very small group of rebels. It's like you know ten or twenty group of rebels, but they have like a castle. They have a keep. They have like a pretty good fort. Mm -hmm. And King John's got some Danish. He's got some uh, you know some Danishes with him. Some Danish mercenaries. And um, they're trying to take this. The whole the whole movie is them trying to take this thing. And Paul Giamatti is King John. Is just like, he, you know, Paul Giamatti. He plays a good angry guy, right? Mm -hmm. So just watching him be like frustrated that he can't take <laughs> this castle is pretty good. It's a pretty good movie. And then between Paul Giamatti freaking out that he's you know losing his kingdom, you've got like the the big the big knight guy. I don't even remember who plays him. He's just like he just clobbers a bunch of people with big claymore. It's good, good film. Good I will film. add it to my it. watch list. All right. But you, but you get to see like some of the siege tactics 
Like, he uses, um, spoilers, but he uses, like, pigs to try to burn it down. Because, like, the, the grease from their fat, like... They burn well, you know. Hot. You ever burn yeah. bacon? Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was, I was like, I was like, I wonder if they, like, if people really did that back then. Like, it's just like... Just like cruel, live pigs. There's cruelty like just, beyond belief. They just led a bunch of live pigs into like a hole and was like, "All right, set them on fire. It'll get really hot. And burn down the castle." Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, it's very. Who figured that out? It's. It seems like something I would do in like a D and D campaign. It would honestly. smell great. It would smell <laughs> so fucking good. Maybe you'd have a barbecue after if any of the meat was. Good. <laughs> so. <laughs> So John marches north because, again, you know, Scotland. Um, and suddenly, like in May, at the request of the rebels, the French decide it's time for payback, which makes sense. This is, again, like unsurprising to anyone. And again, you know, whoever the rebels are, they're just going to ally themselves with the French because that's just what you do. Um, so Prince Louis lands in the south of England and he's actually got a claim to the English throne. I want our 12 year old back! <laughs> and um, so even though John's like relatively militarily successful like there are some keeps that um, are holding out but like again he's not like a horrible general um, so he's like been doing a good job at like kicking the rebels around but the problem is they're just all over the place. And so, like, he really just can't be everywhere at once. And, like, they just seem to keep popping up and more people are deserting him. And this might have had something to do with the fact that he was using mercenaries, like, to subjugate his own people. Um, yes. So, John returns south to try and fight the rebels and Prince Louis. Um, and meanwhile, Scotland decides to attack south again. And so he's facing a war on multiple fronts. So John's down in Lynn, uh, sort of like close to Wales, kind of. Um, and, he, and he's been fighting for a couple of years now, basically. Just those rebel groups just popping up all over the place, playing whack-a-mole. No one really likes him anymore. Um, just like his handful of loyalists and him and all of his like mercenary bros are just trying to figure out their next move. Uh, and while in Lynn, John contracts dysentery. Yay. Oh, good. So. That's he, the one where you shit yourself to death, right? Yes, exactly. It's a fitting yeah, end. The, the um, Oregon Trail. He lived how he died. <laughs> um, <laughs> John reaches Newark. I'm going to have to get better at not laughing at ourselves uh, if, if I'm going to keep doing this. No, uh, no, that's fine. The audience will be tricked into laughing along with us and think we're funny. So, <laughs> John, he, he decides, okay, we got to go to Newark. We got to get to Newark because, you know, that way, like, we can keep fighting the rebels as, as, as he's just in, crapping himself. You should just edit in, like, a sitcom laugh track. <laughs> Cue laughter. And then King John shit himself from dysentery. Oh, ha, 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 ha. We'll be uh, back after these messages from our sponsors. And it's at Newark that John finally uh, craps himself to death all the way on October Newark. 18th. I'm pretty um, sure I've Jesus. trapped myself in Newark. <laughs> <laughs> so his body is carried by his mercenaries back to Worcester Cathedral. Um, and that is where it remains to That's this day. That's nice of them. Like, for mercenaries, you think, well, it's like, fuck it, I got paid. I'm not, like, hauling his... I guess he probably had, like, a next of kin or, like, a right-hand man. Or, like, he had loyalists, right? They were, like, probably some same fans. They hadn't been paid yet. They just didn't need to deliver the body to get paid. <laughs> like, we, we brought back the king's body for the deposit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have the tag? Do you have your ticket with him? Yeah, I need your receipt. <laughs> Uh, so yeah they deliver the king um also along this journey that like uh he was like slowly like pooping himself to death on he allegedly like lost all the crown jewels of england in quicksand although that's kind of unconfirmed that might just be sort of like myth and legend you know um yeah that's, i see that here actually yeah but yeah, so there, John. Uh, there's a uh, yeah, there's a shot of that happening in the end of that movie. 
I yeah. thought I thought it was I thought it was kind of like like cheesy to see in the movie. It's just like okay, he lost and he's dying. Like you don't have to see his. You see him like drop a treasure chest into like some mud or something, and it's just like this is a little overdoing it. But I guess that's actually based off of a real. Yeah, it might have actually happened. We, we don't know for Maybe. sure, but it might have yeah. actually happened. That's like all history is like. There's That's a how lot they say of it quest- happens. Yeah, there's a lot of question marks with pretty much any historical mm. event. Um now his legacy is basically, yeah, like just screwing over everything. I guess he gets like the good point of like, you were the reason why we like started putting like checks and balances on government kind of. So Yeah, when good you're job. so evil, you're responsible for the idea of like a constitution. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, is that you're honestly why, a bad You're why thing, we though? have rules. <laughs> like, it's one of those things, like, human nature, right? You have to learn by getting burned. Yeah. So. How'd it get burned? I don't know. I feel like a lot of... I feel like as far as our conflict resolution and, and uh, just general social skills and self-governance, I feel like we've probably regressed it. From I mean, this is just my personal opi- like opinion, is that I think if you look at like there's probably some fucked up hunter gatherer societies, but if you look at functioning hunter gatherer societies, where it's like they're they're kind of like they're kind of saved by the fact of how small they are, but like people kind of have to agree with each other and get along and work together for everything to work. But when you have governments, when you when you have states, like they usually they're like throughout most of history states have been monarchies or have been empires and they've existed kind of to like enable a ruling class to hold a bunch of power over everyone else and like this is kind of an instance where this is a rare instance where you see that power get walked back whereas throughout most of history you see the trend is power basically gets consolidated until it collapses it seems to be the theme not not like that would be going on now we don't no. we don't have those problems now that's for sure that was history you, history ended right can you like imagine there, wrote a book about it can yeah. you imagine a modern government taxing its citizens to fund like some foreign imperialist war and then having nothing to show for it at the end like i couldn't it just wouldn't happen as we're too civilized now because thanks to the magna carta (laughs) yeah such atrocities will never happen again the only thing that i wish had happened a little differently here is that john's son henry the third actually ends up ruling after john dies which i kind of think it would have been like icing on the cake if it was like the french prince louis just like sweeps in and like not only does england lose all of france but now england like is ruled by a frenchman that would have been great but unfortunately that would have been didn't didn't the original monarchy in england come from normandy right like even the english language was like a combination of like the the proto like french and like Anglican yeah, there language. there are periods in England where yeah, like the nobility yeah, like, like are basically just French. The first, I think, like like King Arthur, Arthur, like the original, like yeah, the original nobility of England, I think was is supposed to be have like foreign origins. So it's like it's kind of always been, you know. And if you look at like kind of especially like the northern ec- ethnicities, like the Scottish, right? Like they're probably more like their heritage probably stems more directly from the inhabitants of that island versus you know the the yeah i don't know enough about england i'm probably talking out of my ass but it's it's interesting that like there's this it's like no you i don't know it's it's also funny like how much why you look at like the middle east and people are like oh look how how much it it's it, they're at war with each other and it's like well yeah look at feudal europe but also like the idea like white people like the idea of whiteness and like people who are like white supremacists and it's just like just a few hundred years ago like white people were killing each other over it's like well you're from the wrong part of europe <laughs> yes and i mean people in india and pakistan also do this people like chinese and japanese people you know it's like we we always no. like point out like, I mean, find some difference down to just humans yeah. are terrible that's all it is just hum- humans are fucking awful i mean 
They can be. Yes. Mm. Yeah. If only we were shit. in charge, I mean, then everything yeah. would be yes. better. <laughs> We're well, not terrible. Well, yeah, Everyone that's because we is. have the Magna Carta. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, we, John. If, if, elected, Thanks, Chad. if elected, we promise that we will abide by the conditions of the Magna Carta for anyone considering voting for us in the, the next election in which we are definitely running. So, Who do we pick as our 12 lords to oversee us? Uh, just like we'll just grab the guys from the Discord server. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, they're qualified. This was a... that was a lot of that was a lot of that was an interesting story. That was a good you did yeah. a lot of good research on this. Well, thanks for uh, sitting here and like listening to me ramble on about some guy who's been dead for eight hundred years. Uh, Dude, appreciate I love guys. I love hearing about dead guys. Yeah. No, I wish I had more to add to the conversation. But... It reminds me that I'm alive, and they're not, and it makes me feel good about myself. Well, I guess we can uh, call it a wrap on the very well, first episode thing, of Cacistocracy. We, we didn't do, we didn't do, uh, we didn't introduce ourselves. Yeah, I, that occurred to I me was, about five minutes ago. That, yeah. So we should maybe that, like, do right that, that and you can edit that in at the beginning. Do the magic of editing. Or you could just leave it at the end. Oh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, it makes it's, the it's mystery. The <laughs> the next one. It's like, yeah, you don't, you, you. Listen no, no, no introductions. We'll do it next guys? time. We'll do it next time. Mystery speakers. Uh, if you're viewers. still listening, what's the I, next episode gonna be on? I have not decided yet. I have got a couple. Of Alexander different... Hamilton. I could. We could do Hamilton. Um, I'm not watching the movie. No, you don't have to I've watch already... the musical. It's fine. But I'll listen to you explain why this why this guy the matters. musical glosses over a lot of fun details yeah. in hamilton's life but he does have a really interesting uh story yes sure. um oh. hamilton is definitely more likable i'd say than john but still not a great dude yeah he he had fun yeah um but all right well until next time cacistocracy Yay.